Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, thank you, Sharon, again for your leadership. Um, Sataya, thank you for the introduction. Just confirming you can see my slide. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, a brief introduction to our team. We are five founding members and um, directors, Sharon being our queen bee and our mothership. Um, then you've got me, we've got Corbin who's on the line, he's going to talk, and two of our colleagues who are not joining, they're more non-executive. We've got Quentin, he's a lawyer and an advocate, practicing advocate, and then Professor Ungani and Kubis, he's um, at um, Seaport, the university in the Western Cape, also specializing in water governance. Um, Okay, so there are a few things that I would like to focus on. And then obviously we've got Farouk who's going to join us and Wim Treter, who's also on the line of Mirlist, but we will introduce them as we get to those slides um, in the presentation. <coughs> and sorry, I've got a cold. So this is a slide that gives us um, a sort of a snapshot of who is Kogo, what are we all about? Um, how do we progress? Um, what are our methodologies? And I'm going to briefly touch on a few things. I think everything starts with the core values for us. Everything is core value based. So you will see there our core values are collaboration, sharing and caring. Um, and that's also where the name comes from. It's collaborative governance for water security. Um, we understand that water security is a wicked problem and a grand challenge. And there's no way that anybody can deal with this without working together. So SDG 17 is one of our prized SDGs is partnerships and networks. And that's why we're super excited that we're able to work with the fora community, Mirlis and a whole host of other parties. And also to be part of this project. Thank you so much for inviting us and being able to be part of this unbelievable um, initiative. Then I want to move over to say where everything started at the top right corner, you will see um, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, the Stellenbosch River Collaborative. So Kogo started with Sharon's um, PhD research and in the research, she established the, um, it's an organic and a non-legal um, um, association of like-minded people in the Stellenbosch area and the river runs through it, if I can put it that way. So they understood the river as um, a key point of connection for everybody. Um, as part of the development of the research, Distel, you will see there, which is now part of the Heineken Group. It's a it's a large um, beverage company situated in Distel, was keenly part of um, the Stellenbosch River Collaborative, and they also supported Sharon's um, research. So it grew. Sharon um, is a networker of note, as for those of you who know her. And we are fortunate enough to be part of um, the UNESCO Be Resilient project um, in South Africa. It's in the biosphere areas in South Africa, and we are in the Cape Winelands biosphere area in the Eerste River catchment, um, where we're looking at climate risk informed decision analysis. And that's also one of the methodologies COGO has adopted as, as principle to the way in which we do things. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Then moving on to the left, we are um, research orientated, and you will notice from the people that we um, that our group of people either um, they already have PhDs or um, Corbin and I are in the process of <laughs> more more misery on my side than Corbin's side. But part of the the, the misery of getting a PhD, I'm only second year now. Um, and all of us are connected to water in some way or another, but Corbin will talk about his research, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, interesting, some of the projects that we've been doing, the Diff Agri project is a Horizon project. Um, I think there's something like 21 universities, um, you might be familiar with it. And again, it was um, the University of Stellenbosch that approached um, Sharon and said, look, we've, we're working with smallholder farmers, and this is why it, it fits quite nicely with this project as well, because it's about understanding how technology um, and more sustainable technology can improve the lives and the livelihoods 
of small scale farmers in four or five African countries, of which obviously Stellenbosch is also a case study. Um, where we got involved in this, I was involved in this project together with another colleague of mine, and we developed a sustainability framework based on corporate reporting framework. So I come from the corporate space and corporate reporting. So that's where um, I, I lean towards. And we've been developing this, um, this corporate reporting framework to measure social impact, which is quite, quite smart. Um, then the same one um, we are now also implementing in the Streetscapes project. And this is in the Kales River area, also in the Cape Town area, where we are trying to um, assist by measuring and monitoring again social impact to understand how the, um, the funders want to understand the benefit of the project for the greater community and the environment. So we're using sustainability um, metrics and, and, and a matrix to, to evaluate whether the social impact is working. Um, then the methodologies that we are using, obviously the, the SDGs, I think it would be crazy not to say that um, you know, it's, it's like a, a North Star for most people um, working in the sustainability space. Then the climate risk informed decision analysis, the CRIDA methodology was developed um, by a few um, people and um, UNESCO was one of them. And it's a very powerful methodology. It's beautiful, it's bottom up, it's an inclusive approach. And when Sharon was part of the initial um, people who were trained on the UNESCO methodology, she said to me, you know what, this is what we're going to adopt for COGO. And I said, let's go. So then for those of you who are not so familiar with corporate reporting, we've got the TCFD and the TNFT. TCFD, climate, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, and the TNFT, the Task Force on Nature um, Related Financial Disclosure. These are these rock my world personally. Um, and it, again, it is a it's a very strong philosophy and methodology how you can incorporate climate change and nature risks and opportunities into, um, well, not just reporting, but into the strategy of corporates. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. Um, here is just a brief um, and, uh, explanation of how we frame collaborative governance. Um, it's quite a complex um, framework and I'm not going to go into too much detail. Corbin has dealt a lot quite with this in his studies. But bottom line, what this means is when you read literature on corporate governance, you will see there's, depending on who you read, there are many ways and there are many um, ways to skin this cat. But important for us, it's all about the climate futures, right? And that's also part of Corbin's um, research. So how it works is we basically have agreement seeking, collective action, and then collaborative systems. These work together and they are founded on core concepts um, there you can see all of those six concepts and it, it works quite well in a process. So it's a circular motion where you influence the worldviews that people have. Um, and you will see that worldviews and the anthropogenic climate change have got a, it's like a dual highway where a certain worldview influences climate change and vice versa. And here, what we are trying to do is to influence and, and, positively change not only climate action, but climate policy policy as well. We believe as COGO that collaborative governance is a powerful way of doing it. The problem is too big to compete. We have to collaborate so that we can get to climate futures where um, we have a chance. I saw now just before I joined that the BBC and the Guardian has now issued out a notice to say, chances that we're gonna reach 1.5 degrees um, soon is, is more likely than not. And when I saw that, I <laughs> wanted to cry. So this is critical that we, um, that we work together and find a solution to this wicked problem. Okay. <sighs> Isn't this just the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen? This is one of the students of Corbin. Um, there was a competition, well, not a competition, but like a, a project that um, Corbin and Sharon was working on way back when. And one of the students designed this. So this is a damsel dragonfly, a specific dragonfly endemic to the area where we operate. And you might be able to see the yellow, uh, the, the blue lines. These represent the Easter River. And the, the, the top wings represent the land uses, the different land uses in this area. So it's a 
realistic map of the area. So our focus is healthy rivers, healthy communities, and healthy economy. So you can see the integrated and the systemic approach that we take, where we understand that you cannot just focus on social impact and environmental impact. You have to focus on economic impact as well. But it's finding that sweet spot. I always talk about the Goldilocks moment where everything um, congeals and, and conforms and finding not too little, not too much, but finding the balance and the equilibrium. So here you will see our, our core concepts represent the wings of the dragonfly. First of all, it's all about nature risk, which obviously includes the water. So you cannot just deal, as you know, with water. You have to look at it from a greater systemic impact, as the nine planetary boundaries tell us. Then we're all about research and data, but it's not just quantitative data, but qualitative data as well. Um, we are inherent, uh, we are more prone to qualitative research, but we understand the value of quantitative as well. And it's all about having the right information, whether it's qualitative or not, and quantitative for better decisions. And we find that if you have the information and you know what to do with the information, it generally leads to better decisions, better actions, better impact, and you can see the circular motion. Then we co-create, never in isolation, never thinking that we are the solution to a problem. We can merely contribute. We might not even solve the problem, but we, we, we choose to believe that we are part of the solution and not part of the problem. And it's backed by scientific research. And then it's all about social impact. So that's also why we chose the cooperative as a legal vehicle for our business, because it's all about social impact. <coughs> So now these are just examples. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but these are just examples of the community engagements based on social impact that COGO in, um, participates in. And you can see we break it up into projects, just more on the ground, boots on the ground orient, oriented, then academic research and then other initiatives. We're going to talk about the Fora Community Initiative, the UNESCO I spoke about, street, uh, streetscapes I spoke about, and Diff Agri. Obviously, we are talking to the River City Network partners at the moment, and here are some of um, our research. Um, Jakob, who was, um, he's not part of COGO, but he worked with um, Sharon and Corbin quite a lot. He developed his PhD on serious games with Bruno Latour. Fascinating research, not that I understand most of it, but it's all about the politics of nature and a flat ontology. Then we participated in the International W12 Water Symposium in Cape Town. You might recall the um, Day Zero in Cape Town. And where I live in Kabecha, Port Elizabeth, we are living Day Zero. So water is really big. It's an integral part of our life. Um, Sharon was part of the Seeds of the Good Anthropocene, and that's also a case study there. Um, and then we also work quite a lot closely with, obviously, the Department of Water and Sanitation, based on strong relationships um that we've built okay so i'm going to hand over to um sharon first to give us a brief introduction and just an introduction a, a segue into how this all started um the eco um corridor concept and then sharon is going to hand over to corbin to to walk us through um this project thanks sharon Thank you, Kati. Um, yeah, I hope Farouk joined us since um, we started. Um, uh, the Fora project actually started initially with Farouk and, and his um, um, colleagues approaching the University of Stellenbosch to assist them with bioinvasives or invasive alien invasive clearing and training and looking after heritage. Uh, Fora is a, it has high historical value as a, a settlement in the 17 and 1800s um, and a proposal was or two proposals was drawn up submitted to um, our university at the social impact division but not successful because it wasn't a systemic um, approach my colleagues um, uh, COVID set in and and the restrictions and my colleagues approached me afterward and asked if I'm willing to take this over um, due to my work in collaborative governance and in the catchment, which I did. So um, at, a, at a meeting, a, a, a public meeting with our Department of Forest and Fishery and, and Environment, 
I um, I, I did a word on Kogo and um, Farouk found me there and approached me and that's where everything started. So we literally started from scratch. Um, we had this these two documents, but we literally started from scratch. Over to Colwyn. Oh, thank you, both Cathy and Sharan, and also just hello to everyone um, in this presentation. Um, I prepared to share this slide with you just to give you some context to where the Tory Community Project is situated. So. Top left, you will see the southern western tip of Africa, which is where Cape Town is. Um, and well, I don't know if Katy can point it out, but with the mouse where Stellenbosch is. But this is pretty much a wine capital. And there's a lot of agricultural practices that happens uh, in this region. But you also have rivers that move through the landscape as well. Um, and if you are familiar with uh, South Africa's history, you would know that uh, spatial segregation is closely related to rivers as well, as a way to marginalize communities and also to basically fringe communities. What you see in the bottom left image is a population map of one of such fringe communities, which is the Fora community, which is on the periphery of the Cape Town district and the Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch municipality, and often falls between these two overlapping um, governing sectors. So there's a lot of, um, how do you say, wake in the motion um, since we became a democratic republic of South Africa, but uh, basic service delivery is still not reached this community in terms of water and sanitation, but also just um, being at the uh, lower end of the Easter River is that um, this is a community that also has been kind of in, they've had to adapt to many conditions that impact the community, not so much to contribute to how the community is shaped within the various uh, systemic structures around them, so it's a very interesting uh, case site, and it's very uh, contextually situated between many, many things. Towards the right, you will see how contested these spaces are, with a fence running through the river next to where the Pori um, community is located. At. And that, more than anything, symbolizes a cross-boundary conversation that needs to be had here, um, which has to do with river identity identity, river health, but more so as well, uh, cultural identity and cultural health. So uh, just I would say in the bottom of the image is the introduction that we had with uh, Farouk and some of the community representatives in Fori. We did some walkabouts. We basically got to understand the lay of the land, what uh, some of the contextual concerns and how we might be able to bring this forward. And it was a very informal conversation that brought about this idea of a, what, what about an ecocultural corridor um, and, and what that might mean. So my research, I'm a professionally trained product designer, also work in service design, com visual communication design and systems design. Um, so kind of a broad spectrum of various design approaches. Uh, I'm interested in this correlation between designing for sustainability, but also how that is positioned towards climate futures. Uh, a quick example is just the SDGs. It's pinned to 2030, and it's something that's still coming in terms of a specific date. So a lot of the initiatives that we have is basically we future shaping once we start aligning to these SDGs, future driven agendas. But how can we go about them? And how can we co-create something like an uh, ecocultural corridor? So, if Kati, if you could go to the next slide. My research work uh, specifically looks at scenarios as these crossovers to bring forward the sense-making, meaning-making, imaginative, conceptualizing approaches that borrows from design methodologies, but can be explored through 
designers, non-designers. Um, and one of the cases that you will see here in the top of this image collage is a workshop that we ran last year at the Sustainability Institute, which is also between um, Fourier and Stellenbosch next to the East River. Uh, we ran a scenario building workshop and part of the tools that we used was a scenario building cards and a scenario thinking canvas. Now, I don't know if some of you are familiar with this concept or the term called design thinking, but where design thinking really holds a lot of um, gravitas in collaborative practices is that collaboration as co-creation processes, co-design processes is coming from um, design methods. And the value that brings to how we participate, how we collaborate and how we shape um, ideas, visions and ideologies has a way of going from conceptualizing to implementing. And with design thinking, this happens. The same Corbin, can be. Corbin, sorry, uh, twenty minutes. Okay. Yeah. The same can be applied to scenario thinking and futures thinking. We can conceptualize these things, and it's great and it's wonderful, and it lends itself to actually speaking about futures. Specifically in this, what happened in this setting, um, Farouk, you will see him on the right with a with a brown vest with two of the community members from Fori, we basically played this game. Um, what you see in the bottom image is in the middle is cards that have words on them with definitions. And on the side of the cards, there's these various patterns. So once you put one word next to another word, you have this uh, kind of contrast between ideas, terminologies related to futures. And when you discuss them, you basically embed a lot of meaning and sense making through dialogue and narrative into this future shaping process. And it was actually quite an uh, exceptional experience. And since then, this project has taken up a direction of its own. But to share light on that, uh, I think Farouk is on the call. So maybe Farouk can just uh, bring his perspective into how he sees an eco-cultural corridor um, happening. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. Um, yes, um, the importance of the ecological corridor, uh, cultural corridor is uh, very significant to us as a community. Um, as a representative of the Koi uh, community, indigenous people of uh, the Cape, we are situated uh, next to the Easter River, and we have our own ways of living that is different from dominant groups or majority of people of the country. So the ecocultural uh, opportunity would enhance uh, the in our culture as well as have an impact on the environment. So we see ourselves as not separate from the environment as indigenous people, as also. Um, we refer also to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the UNDRIP, Article 26 and 31, where we as Indigenous people have also recognized the environment as a sacred and a sovereign entity as ourselves. And why? We, so we, our focus is to protect the remain of our natural environment uh, for the future generations, as we have lost so much and we cannot afford to do nothing. So um, it's important that we as a community, we took the ownership to patrol the river uh, for watching out for pollution, or also damage, damaging to the environment, where we saw that um, the impact uh, alien vegetation and the water quality has on wildlife because it was still wildlife as you can see in the slide the, the previous slide there was a fence uh, so the fences also has an impact on the livelihood of the people uh, making use of the river um, so our focus is to, to encourage heritage and tourism um, also to look at economic benefits 
to um, the community and the cultural uh, community. So also the indigenous knowledge systems is where we as indigenous people as practice sustainability and looked after nature for uh, 400 years already before um, the encroachment of uh, colonial systems and so on. So we as uh, indigenous community, we have um, a focus is on in the systems that we see ourselves as uh, indigenous systems are in agriculture, medicine, security, botany, zoology, crafts and skills, and in just linguistics. So in terms of collaboration, it's important for us to, as different groups, corporations, government institutions, to share ideas and to share opportunities to encourage uh, shared futures um, where we as indigenous people to address our socioeconomic uh, de uh, development um, imbalances. Um, the value system of cooperative is uh, we as indigenous community, um, we have suffered a lot, you know, through all the exploitation that have been felt. Through this uh, engagement, we can address the imbalances. So this is a good opportunity to, to uh, establish empowered models and engagements for sustained, uh, sustained indigenous uh, communities uh, within the space of nature conservation and to enhance um, what we are currently doing, patrolling the area. Um, yeah. So our focus, our, our Aboriginal tribal police uh, that we're part of, um, is representing the Khoi indigenous people of the Southern Africa. Um, and I'm currently a Brigadier General there uh, at the Aboriginal Tribal Police, as well as from the uh, cultural group, the Kohokwa tribe. Um, I'm a senior chief for the area, which um, the East River from the coast uh, to the West Coast, as well as the Wurzenberg area, is our tri tribal territory. So we taken the responsibility to have engagements, meet meaningful engagements with government institutions or corporations to enhance um, shared futures. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Farouk, that was fantastic. Um, I'd like to introduce Vim Triter. Um, Vim is the cellar master at the Mirlist um, Winery. And um, Vim, if you can come on and um, talk to us about your participation and where you fit in into this fantastic project. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, hello, uh, everyone. Vim, Vim yeah. uh, you have uh, 13 minutes. 13. No, don't worry. I won't, I won't need close to that. All right. So, hi, everyone. Um, so maybe just a bit of context in terms of, of where Mielis comes in and fits in. So uh, the, the farm is situated on the banks of the Yesta River. We are just north of the Fora community, so we're the, their next door neighbor. Um, so we've got about a 1.7 kilometer boundary with the river. So uh, obviously the, the river health and everything that happens in the river impacts our farming um, quite, quite heavily. Um, and we obviously have our own farming community of a community of farm workers that actually live on the farm and right next to the river. Now, the, the Myberg family have owned the farm since 1756. So now they're in their eighth generation ownership of the property. So they're obviously heavily invested and, and in, in the shrine in the area. And uh, if we look at Mielist itself, it's since the first vintage in, in 1980 of our sort of Rubicon, our flagship wine, it's become an internationally recognized uh, wine brand. And I think with that comes a certain amount of responsibility as well. So um, initially when I met Sharon for the first time, it was to do with an alien clearing, invasive species clearing along the banks of the river where we had uh, discussions. And I think since then, just the, a lot of the, the philosophies and aspects that Kogo um, and their approach really dovetails quite nicely with what we as a company as a brand and as a farm uh, aspire to as well. So there's a lot of those value systems. And if I go back to that slide of that damsel fly, the, the pillars that they focus on is, is very much what we, we focus on as well. So if we look at the, our interaction with our natural environment, 
like I said, the, the river really is our lifeblood. It's, it's our only source of water on the farm. So the lower East River irrigation scheme is our partner in, in water supply. So the quality of the water and obviously the certainty of water supply is of critical importance for us, um, which has a massive impact on our economic um, output as well. Um, and uh, since then, we are now engaged in terms of alien clearing, establishing natural corridors and uh, practices that are being employed across the winemans, being water wise, drip irrigation, cover crops, and a number of practices that we're trying to, to make part of the project. I think obviously then from a social point of view, like I said, we've got our own farming community that lives on the bank of the river as well. And the, the Myberg family that owns the farm has has always had an approach of giving back and uplifting the community. So we've actually established our own workers trust, uh, empowerment trust in 2008 already. Um, and since then, there's been a transfer of land. So the property that the, the houses reside on has been transferred into this company that's owned by the empowerment trust. Uh, there's companies that have been established. Uh, the one of them is a well-recognized storage facility that a lot of the industry makes use of. The other one, which is the forer portion of land, is actually where we um, envisage for the next round of this project to actually be based on. Uh, and that is owned wholly by our workers' trust. Um, and that's always been part of that skills transfer and development uh, of the approach that we wanna, we wanna apply. And then the third portion of that, I think that sustainability is of course the economic factor. So I think we are in a fortunate position that we are a successful, profitable wine brand. Um, and we hope to contribute with projects like these and creating environmental uh, these corridors and creating uh, opportunities of establishing new companies and, and new opportunities to, to give those opportunities, uh, make them available to our employees, to the larger community. And I think that makes it uh, a very exciting project to be part of. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. That was, that was beautiful. So on this, the next slide, I know it's quite busy, but I would just like to take you through um, the legal structure, um, how we plan to implement this. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the left hand side, you will see there how we've broken up the side is this is the way in which the cooperative will be structured as the legal vehicle within which this project will take place. Then this, the, the next one is um, the process that will take place. And then lastly, we will explain some of the benefits of using this legal vehicle. Um, as you know, there are many different types of legal vehicles or then formats that one can use to provide legal personality um, to a project or an initiative um, of this sort. The reason why we use the cooperative is that it is so well suited to what we want to do and it matches perfectly with the intent of social impact. How we do this is as follows. So um, you will see the Vim was talking about the Myberg Family Trust and also the Muralist um, Workers Trust. These two entities are the shareholders of the Fora Agri Village Company. This company is the owner of the immovable property, the land that Vim was talking about on which the um, improvements will take place and where this, this project will kick off. Um, the Fora Agri Village will become a founding shareholder in the cooperative as one of the founding shareholders. Secondly, Kogo will then also become a founding shareholder. And the reason why these two will be the initial founding shareholders are the, the diverse contributions and values, um, of value, not values, value that will be brought to the cooperative. In the instance of the agri-village, that's the immovable property, but then over and above that, it's also um, the employer of some of the community um, members who, who live there and work there, and you've listened to them, you can see it's, it's more than that. It's also the business acumen, it's the skills transfer, it's the goodwill, it's, it's paying it forward and contributing positively to society and the environment that makes this a powerful partner. From the COGO perspective, we bring um, the research element through Sharon and um, the rest of us, we bring together the network because if it wasn't for 
combining all the dots, we wouldn't be sitting here and explaining all of this. Also the legal and the governance part of it. Um, we will be registering the co-op, both Quentin and I are lawyers, but you're not allowed to hold that against us. Um, and we will be dealing with all the governance and the legal aspects of, of managing this COGO will also be the secretariat and making sure that everything runs well. You cannot have collaborative governance if you don't have good corporate governance, right? So then, um, as I said, they will become the, the shareholders. And here it's important to note that the difference between a company or any other type of business for, form and a cooperative is that your contribution does not necessarily have to be financial. It can be in kind, it can be knowledge sharing, it can be services, it can be support. Mentoring is a very important aspect, etc. Then we move on to the next one. So now that we've created Patty, how much time? Well, yes. five minutes. Five minutes ish. Um, so now that we've created the um the cooperative, this is then where we convert shareholding to membership. And that's a very powerful way in which you, you include the whole community. So it's no longer shareholders, but members. And then the fora community will be an allocating member. So we allocate membership because this is all about the fora community, right? If it wasn't for them, we would not be doing this. And then any other interested party, be it a commercial investor, a social investor, a service provider, a client, a customer, an employee, any kind of stakeholder who has an interest in the project or the project impacts them has the ability to then contribute value and then they return, in, in return, they receive membership. Here you can see the benefits. So um, as Vim was saying, um, Merlist is profitable, but what we envisage here is social impact, which is profitable because we want this, this project to stand on its own feet and to have not only a social impact, but an economic impact as well. So profit sharing is, is able, um, will also improve um, and assist with the fora community. Voting rights, so voting rights, um, appointing the directorate, representation, all of these good things, the ability to share in leadership and management, this structure enables the community to participate directly in all of this. Then you have control as well because you vote and you nominate um, the members on the board. And from a South African perspective, we have, um, Corbyn was talking about the inequalities and we have legislation that's trying to eradicate the inequalities in South Africa. It's the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act, triple B, double E. And from a corporate perspective for investors or angels investors, this is also beneficial for this. So a very high level snapshot the way in which, and we're in the process now of registering this co-op. Okay, so um, what we bring to this specific river um, city network, you can now see the impact of the, the program, but um, we bring not only the project itself, but we also bring the philosophy and the methodologies in here. The CRIDA model, I explained very briefly, but we don't have time for that, but it's a powerful methodology and with the UNESCO project, we now already in phase two and three, we've got the first um, set of results, which is very exciting. And all of these learnings, you know, it's a building a block approach, we're incorporating into this project as well. I'm going to briefly hand over to Corbin that he can talk about the horizons mapping, giga mapping and science scenario. And then Corbin will end up, um, finish up the presentation um, sure. from here. Thank you. No, thank you, Cathy. So yeah, following from the credo model, what we also offer to the River Cities Network is um, these design methods that lend itself to giga mapping, which is a method used with systems mapping, systems complexity mapping. So not just like actor mapping, um, resource mapping, but looking at various uh, aspects to, to the complex settings. Um, relating to futures is the three horizons. Some of you might be familiar with that, but it's also a way of um, mapping potentials, um, challenges, risks, and bringing those forth to desirable futures over a period of time. And then, of course, with scenario building. So I think what the big uh, offering is from Kogo's contribution and participation in the River Cities Network is this 
shift from conceptual um, conceptualizing to implementing um, and actualizing through rather pragmatist approaches. Um, so Kathy, if you could just go to the next slide, this is just the elevator pitch of Kogo is just our vision and our mission. Um, it's brief, but we navigate with our vision, we navigate collaborative governance for inclusive water security and prosperity. And with our mission is co-creating resilient ways to respond to socioeconomic impact on our ecological capacity. And if you want to know more about us, what we do, or reach out, uh, you are very happy welcome to look at our um, Togo website as well as getting in touch with us through our email details. So yeah, from my side, I don't know uh, from all of you, if you had a very compelling uh, experience uh, peeking into what we do and how we do it, but for your attention, thank you so much to everybody in the River Cities Network project uh, for nurturing the space, Paul and the team, and also to um, Farouk and to Wim. Thank you so much. Thank you, Satya. Over to you. I'm going to uh, stop sharing now. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very, very interesting. Um, uh, you guys finished before 